I started this business because I wanted to utilize uh, timber resources in Illinois differently. I got a degree from the University of Illinois in Forestry. I spent six years in the Marine Corps as a combat engineer doing construction. And when I got done with both those things, I felt like there was something different that we could do with our trees besides make them into pallets. So what I started doing was building buildings like this. And I've been at it now for about 14 years. And I actually started my business building new timber frame buildings, which means that we use mortise and tenon and pegs. And because of that, um, I started to get asked to restore a lot of old buildings and to replicate a lot of buildings. This barn that we built for the Antique Engine Tractor Club in Geneseo um, was a new construction timber frame built primarily out of white oak, all sourced within about 60 miles. We build with about 250,000 board feet of material per year. And just to kind of give you a frame of reference, your average 165-year-old white oak tree in the woods is about 250 board feet. So that gives you an idea of the volume of trees that we use. Of that 250,000 board feet, I source about half of it within 60 to 100 miles of our shop. We have our own sawmill and our own four-sided planer. We have our own design department, our own engineering. So everything that we put up happens in-house. This building that we did for the Antique Engine Tractor Club, we did in conjunction with the Guild. And so the Guild is a nonprofit organization. It's also the basis for our continuing education system for the kind of carpentry that we do. We're a federally recognized program and have a federal apprenticeship program. Our company has done six of these community events now in Illinois, most of them revolving around barns, primarily because Illinois is an agricultural state. So the kind of things that we get asked to do are ag-related, mostly barns and stuff like that when we do community events. We've done a few other things like an observation tower. And in general, I try to build with vernacular architecture, meaning the, the kind of proportions that you would see in historic buildings are generally the kind of proportions that I use, roof pitches, things like that. So this building, I think, was 48 by 72 with an A12 roof pitch, set up to look like it's got a hay mow. We even put a hay prow on one end of it. We're, we started this business primarily as a new construction timber frame company, and I got kind of roped into a lot of the restoration work kind of after the fact. And the slideshow that I'm going to show you is going to be um, all barn restoration photos, I think mostly from Illinois. Sometimes our restorations just take on <coughs> aspects of just paint, siding, and roof steel. A lot of what we do is foundation work, though, primarily because most of the buildings that we work on are older, meaning that they generally have some kind of limestone or rubble foundation. So what we've gotten into is lifting a lot of buildings, putting foundations underneath them. Um, one of the things that we do a lot, too, is open them up so people can put equipment in them, bigger equipment in them than they uh, could you know, with the historic sort of configuration. Um, so what I do is I start with an assessment of buildings, and this happens to be an 1847 or 1842 threshing barn in Elmwood, Illinois that we restored as a community event. And it's pretty typical for communities or historic groups um, to come to us and say, hey, you know, we really want this barn to be in our living history museum or in our village, <coughs> or in the case of the community of Elmwood, the founding person the founding man of Elmwood, Mr. Phelps. This was the barn that he built on his farm. So the community really wanted to save it. It doesn't look too bad from the outside, but as is typical of most of those buildings, you know, people didn't keep a very good roof on it. So it's really rotten from the inside out. So what we did in that particular case is we just strip everything off. And because I'm a timber frame carpenter, what I'm really after is the structure. Buildings that were built post-1915, 1920 are much more expensive for us to restore. They tend to have less overall value, but heavy timber structures like these hewn buildings, we can get back to the core of the structure and we view the siding and the roof material as um, a maintenance thing. You know, we're looking at a building here that's had siding on it for 170 years, stripping the siding off and putting new siding on it. It's not bad, really, for a lifespan of um, something that really is just maintenance. And we reframed this one. Unfortunately, I don't have a photo of it with new siding on it. But um, in this particular case, we left the building in place, stripped everything off of it, reframed it, kept the granaries, kept the threshing floor, 
uh, left it on its foundation. We lifted up a little bit of it to do um, a little bit of leveling and basically put new rafters on it and a couple of new posts. One of the things that happened really with the advent of the hay track was that in a lot of cases the straining beams in these old barns were cut out and it was one of the things that really led to the fall of some of these early barns that we work on. Because the straining beams were taken out, then the barn starts to come apart, tie beams start to fail, starts to spread, and this particular building, that's really where its downfall began, was probably around 1865 or so when they put a hay carrier in there. Um, this is another threshing barn. It seems like um, people in historic groups are really interested in threshing barns. They were built for a very short period of time in Illinois, especially during the wheat boom of the 1840s, 1850s, 1860s. By the time the 1860s roll around, we start to see fewer threshing barns being built as people start switching over to livestock more. And so this happens to be one that we did for Midway Village. And they were so concerned about the fact that this was the last threshing barn, pre-Civil War threshing barn that they had in whatever county Rockford's in. Um, that you can see how much new stuff went back in it. And what people are concerned about when they have us do work like this, especially museums, is that we keep as much of the original fabric in the building as possible. And so, in the case of this building, almost 70% of the actual frame was replaced. All the siding was replaced, all the rafters were replaced, but it's the configuration and the concept that it was a threshing barn that was important for them to keep in mind. And we get into some fairly complicated joinery. We don't, um, we use mechanical fasteners. We have our own fab shops, so we do all our own hardware. But wherever possible, what we do is we try to keep with the spirit of whatever frame typology was going on at the time. So if it's a joined frame, meaning that it's a timber frame, it's mortise and tenon, we try to keep with that. So rather than replacing a tie beam, in the case of something that's this important, it's that important to these people, you know, we'll double scarf in a joint, you know, rather than nail stuff to the side of it or kind of scab it together. And most of what we do, we have to remember is that until about 100 years ago, for the last 4,000 years, our ancestors were building this way. So what's happened in the last 100 years is really pretty new. So when I, had to, when I started to learn how to do this stuff, I really didn't have to look very far back in time. But it is pretty amazing how quickly we forget those techniques and that joinery. And that's really what we're about when we put these buildings back together for museums. This is uh, setting some rafters on the roof. Just a, a shot looking down through it. And uh, Midway Village wanted to use reclaimed siding, which is not too hard for us to get, and reclaimed sheeting boards. Wasn't off the original barn, but it was off of some other barns from Illinois. This is another one. Uh, this is an 1868 hay barn. And in a lot of cases, these buildings have been neglected for 40 or 50 years. They're full of stuff and equipment. They're leaning a little bit. But if they're timber frames, we can usually find a pretty likely candidate who wants them. This particular barn went down to Collinsville. This came from my neck of the woods over by Knoxville, Illinois. And uh, the Collinsville Area Recreational District wanted to put together a living history museum. And what they wanted was were period buildings. This building um, owned by this individual was of no value to him. He was going to burn it. So we, um, we bought it for $500 and uh, cleaned up the site for him. We dismantled it. Once we dismantle these buildings, we take them back in the shop like this. And we start to determine what kind of work that is we're going to do with them. So we take the skeleton of the frame or the timber frame and we lay it out in the shop, basically put it back together and then fix it. And in this particular case, what you're looking at here is a bent. And bents in general run perpendicular to the roof axis. So it'd be like a gable wall. And you can see that for this particular frame, we replaced this post and a couple of girts. But all in all, it's mostly the original material. And then we start to put them together. Um, we do often get hired to do hand raisings for people. Sometimes because they want to see that. They might want to see something done with horses. They might want to see something done with mules. Or they might just want to see 30 people stand up a bent, just like a typical frame raising used to be. Um, but in general, that's not very cost effective. 
So for me to do frame raisings is quite a bit more expensive than for me to rent a crane for pretty obvious reasons. So in general, we, um, we crane all of our stuff together. And we usually put a barn, say a 40 by 60 timber frame barn up in about a day and a half with four guys. Or I can spend a day or a day and a half with about 40 people. So you can see why it gets to be a little bit more. It's sort of OK. We've worked with like the Carpenters Union before. We've worked with other groups who want to do barn raisings. And we'll put 30 or 40 people together. But it's still pretty difficult to get just 30 or 40 people off the street to raise a frame because maybe that's not what they do every day. There's a little bit of confusion. you know. You've got a little bit more interest than you've really got ability. So it tends to be something that is a little bit dicey. Um, just a little bit further along with this frame construction, uh, we're setting uh, purlin plates and rafter plates in this particular case right now. This is at the Willoughby um, Farm Heritage Site in Collinsville. And uh, sheeting. We typically try to go back with um, original means and methods, which means we'll put 1x10s back on for, se for sheeting, um, skip sheet the roof, put steel on it, something like that. I think they had us put corrugated metal on here. Sometimes we work for clients who want steel siding. Um, usually that's a, a private client. Usually these heritage groups don't want stuff like that on there. And there's the building all closed in. We actually framed that building, uh, sheeted it, primed it, and painted it put the roof on it in about three weeks with about 25 people. And this was a community event. <clears throat> this is a pretty typical site for us. This is another barn. Um, we move a lot of these as well. Sometimes I just pick them up. Sometimes I take them apart. But these are often barns that are in fine shape, but the owner doesn't have a use for. But there are quite a few other people out there who do. And so I take them apart and I build them back together like this. So what you're seeing here is that barn with its framework on its new site. And one of the things that we've kind of learned over the years is that um, a lot of material builds up between the siding and the frame. And so you start to get quite a bit of rot between the frame and the timber. And so what I've started to do is come in and install one by three nailers over the whole outside of the frame. And that sort of becomes the area where we can have some rot without affecting the frame. And that's what you see sort of as this light area here. And I think we've probably done over 100 of these now. Um, we have three going on right now. One just came from Port Byron, another one from Geneseo, and another one in Indiana that we're all putting back up as homes. This one got re-erected um, as a garage. So we built doors for it. We um, put standing seam metal on the roof, put cypress siding on it. We have a molder, so we make our own battens. And uh, another one. So tornadoes hit a lot of these timber frames. And I've done a lot of tornado rep rest restoration work. And timber frames tend to hold up the best, typically because the roofs blow off, which is pretty handy. Because um, <laughs> with later buildings, <laughs> they just kind of get twisted apart, you know, especially stuff that's nailed together. Um, buildings built after 1910, 1915 that get hit by tornadoes tend to be damaged beyond repair, whereas timber frames tend to be able to withstand it. Um, and this is an example of that. The tornado blew the roof off of it, but the frame was fine. So we came and um, stripped out, stripped off all the siding. And this was a, I think this is an 1857 threshing barn built primarily out of white oak. And uh, it's like hewn 12 by 12, so a real classic example of an early Illinois barn. Yeah, I can give you costs as we go along. Um, I should have probably mentioned that from the beginning. That first one, that Phelps barn that we did, we did that as a community event, so we charged them like $16,000. But in reality, it's probably a $100,000 restoration. There's a lot of volunteer hours in it. That one that we did for CARD, the second one that we looked at, I think we did that for about $80,000. There was, once again, quite a bit of volunteer hours and donated material in it, so it's probably about $140,000. This is one that we did for a client. Um, you know, for example, a foundation alone on this was 44000 We might put another $100,000 into the building, something like that. And I've got a few more that we've done for private people, and I'll kind of, I'll just say this is what this one costs. Yeah, you bet. 
Um, here we're getting ready to stand up the vents. So when we put these frames together now, we use a spreader bar and a crane rather than pike poles and 30 people. And uh, we'll raise the vent. And um, we actually put this whole frame up in a day with about 15 people. You can see that there's quite a bit of restored material in the first vent, which isn't too unusual on gable walls, especially north facing gable walls to get a lot of abuse. And then again, finished. So there's about $160,000 in this one to this point, probably, with battens. Um, it's a full concrete floor, a little bit of stone veneer work on it. I think it's 44 by 40 with an 812, and it's got a full hayloft upstairs and a new steel roof. Cypress siding again. Um, this is a $40,000 job that we did up front. Um, we see a lot of people who want to do a little bit of barn adaptation or conversion. In this case, what this guy wanted to do was be able to drive his cars, a truck or something, and park it underneath his barn like a garage. So we basically cribbed up the whole back of the barn. Here you can see we've kind of cribbed it up. We've stabilized the front so that we can support it, removed the whole front of this old dairy barn, put in new foundation walls for him, close-up shot of some cribbing towers while we do a little bit of reframing on the sill plate. And then he en ends up with something like that. Um, I didn't do the siding on this job or the, the roof. He put wood shingles back on it, which is something that we generally don't recommend to people. We have historic groups who really, really want to do wood shingles. But the reality is they're generally underfunded to begin with and are really scraping money together to put these buildings up. And the last thing they really need to do is pay somebody every two or three years to go up and replace a shingle. So we usually push steel roofs pretty hard for the buildings that we do. When did, um, they, start using when did they start? Yes. I don't know, five or 6,000 years ago. <laughs> um, really stopped around 1950 here. You know, you see pretty decent um, western red cedar shingles here up until about 1950. And then after that, you know, People got into these sort of aesthetic shakes and stuff like that. But the sawn shingle um, in our part of the world here in the Midwest, really they started making white pine shingles in around 1837 in Saginaw, Michigan. And then there were shingle mills all over the place. White pine is a horrible choice for a shingle because it really only lasts about five or six years. Um, there were a lot of oak and walnut shingles produced here prior to the Civil War. We often get asked to replicate those, but um, after about 1900, it's almost all western red cedar here. And that's what he's got on here is a western red cedar shingle. So we, um, we, I mentioned earlier we do a lot of lifting as well. So besides taking buildings apart, I just jack them up you know, and haul them away. And we use a system like this with a 50-ton jack. Um, that's a 500-ton hydraulic motor, little 110 plug-in. So we can lift quite a bit with it. We had a couple manifolds there run into a couple jacks. And um, we'll lift buildings up and put them on big pieces of steel, put dollies underneath them. You guys have probably all seen house moving before. Uh, this is actually a picture of a railroad station that we moved. It was 50 feet long. So in some cases, it makes a lot more sense for us to move buildings than it does to dismantle them. What's the cost of moving that railroad um, we could probably do something. This was part of a much bigger, bigger package. I actually moved 11 buildings at the same time. But this one, probably 20 or 30,000 bucks, you know, to go a couple miles. You know, in this case, this was in the west suburbs, so we had like a $60,000 bill to the power company because we were moving it through the village of Lockport and they had to disconnect all the primaries and all that kind of stuff. But we moved five buildings that day, so that cost was kind of spread out. But twenty or thirty thousand dollars, probably to lift a building up, move it a couple miles, ten miles, something like that. As long as there's, you know, seventeen feet is about the limit. I think it might be a, a little bit lower on railroad crossings. But once we get over seventeen feet in height, um, then costs can kind of go up if we have to dismantle part of the roof or something like that. This is the case where we did just take the roof off a building. This is a twenty-four by forty. 1840s threshing barn again. And in this case, we just went and stuck it on some I-beams. I put it on the back of the truck, just hauled it over to a site, backed it into the hole, and set it back down. 
And we did that. That was a 13 mile move, and that was like 6,600 bucks just to do the move. Everything ready to go. I'll give you an example. How low is that weight? That, um, there's probably eight to 10,000 board feet in that frame. Oak weighs about four pounds a board foot, 30, 40,000 pounds. In the case of the train station, for example, you know, I often get, you know, each one of those H beams was 3,500 pounds. So I got two of those, I got 7,000 pounds in steel. I'll have 20 or 30,000 pounds in iron sometimes um, underneath a building that weighs 40 or 50,000 pounds. <coughs> So we got to take that into account too. So weight for us is never really an issue, um, especially with those dollies, because we can just put more axles underneath it. Um, this is something that we asked to get to do to do a lot for people as well. Um, this is a dairy barn that sort of had foundation issues all the way around it. Some new owners bought it and they wanted to use the operation again. And so what we did is come in the basement, crib it up didn't use any I-beams because there was really no way to get them in, replaced a bunch of sill plates and posts because the um, livestock had taken kind of a toll on it over the last 50 years. And we put some piers in and we put some new posts in for them and uh, basically pulled all our cribbing out. They, uh, they want to use the upstairs. This is kind of a small shot of a much larger photo, but um, coming in and kind of leveling these buildings out giving them new feet is something that we do quite a bit. Um, that whole job was like 100,000, but only 20 of it was the foundation. We also stripped the whole hay mount floor and put new decking down, fixed the siding, um, fixed the door, did some other little odds and ends like that. But I think the lifting portion of that was about 20,000. And uh, I don't know how many of you have seen the old beef barn at the University of Illinois campus. This is one that we were asked to move by the Piatt County Historical Society. And we took it apart about three years ago. It was built in 1912, which is right at the end of timber frame buildings and right at the beginning of this new technology. And so these buildings, as I said, are much more difficult to take apart. Um, so a little shot, the interior framing. These actually aren't solid posts, they're all laminated together. And the floor, in exa for example, on this building in the Haymow is two by fours on edge, just nailed together over the top of 10 by 10 girts that are eight feet on center. And you can see that there's a lot of studding in here, a lot of little pieces of wood, which makes our job a lot more complicated. And so when I take these buildings apart, I just have to plain cut them apart in sections, modular sections. And they paid us about $272,000 to take this building down put it on something like 35 flatbeds and truck it to Monticello, where it's sitting now in a big building waiting for them to gather enough funds together to re-erect it, which is going to be about six or $700,000. It's a big building. It's about 54 feet to the peak. I think it's like 60 by, or 50 by 80, but it's huge, huge hay mow, big open space. Um, in a lot of cases, I just crane the whole roof sections off like this. So the idea here for them was to keep the shingles, keep the rafters, keep the sheeting. That's a 42 foot span on that rafter section. So what we've done is craned it off, set it on the ground, attached it to another crane where we're going to split it in half and uh, load it on a truck and ship all the roof sections over to Monticello. It's a little bit farther along taking this barn down. Um, I often do hay mount floors this way as well, where we just lift out whole sections of the hay mount floor. And I think these were 12 by 20s probably, 12 by 30 sections of flooring. And uh, just loading them right on a truck to go. Log barns are also something that um, we see a lot as well. This is a pretty typical example of a log barn that we might work on. This is near Waterloo, Illinois. It's um, covered with siding, probably covered with siding almost immediately. It's an interior photo. And this is a different log building, but just to give you an example of how we restore log buildings, it's something that we've started to do a lot. I think we've done about a dozen of these now. Um, we're doing one right now for a fellow over by Kiwani. 
Um, it happened to be that I think, um, I guess he's probably sixth or seventh generation or so on his farm, and right next to the main house, they still have the original cabin that his great-great-great-grandfather built or something. So he had us dismantle that building, take it back to the shop, and then what we do is basically rebuild it, put in new pieces of wood as needed, rebuild the corners, and re-chink it. Um, I thought I had a, unfortunately I don't, well, I think I do later. I have a finished photo showing the chinking, but it's not in order. Uh, Gothic arch barns. They're really, they were really a great idea for space, but from a sort of an engineering standpoint, in a windy climate, they don't work out so well. So you see a lot of these buildings get racked by the wind pretty badly. And in general, these barns were kit barns, you know, built out of laminated timbers, big hoops. The downside to them, the thing that they didn't really think about is they didn't really have a lot, a lot of lateral wind bracing in them. So one of the things that we do is go and straighten buildings like this. And I think this was about $18,000 for us to go straighten it. We do it in about a day. And we'll do a couple of these a year for people. Somebody will get a straight line wind or something and their barn will get smacked. And so what I do is I have somebody come and just take their post hole digger and drill a bunch of holes out in the yard, maybe six inches below the driveway or whatever. Stick a piece of steel in there that I can hook onto. And then what I do is I use turfer winches and lugalls so that I can ratchet the building over slowly. I bring the building over, and in the meantime, of course, this, this Gothic arch barn is about 40 feet long, and what we've done is we've cabled from here all the way to the back of the building, put a turnbuckle in there, tighten it up. We've got a big I-beam on the back of the building, so that what we're doing is really moving the whole thing together as a unit, because clearly, otherwise, I'd just tear the gable wall off doing that. So we just draw the whole building over, adjusting it as we go, and then we go inside and we put a lot of lateral bracing on top of those laminated rafters inside. And usually we'll do that with something like a one by six. Um, oftentimes we'll do shear walls on the inside, which means that we'll use big sheets of plywood or something like that, just nail the heck out of it. And then we leave. And uh, this is one we did up in Orland Park for a little, uh, for a writing center. Sills are another thing that we do a lot because so many early barns around here in the Midwest were built so close to the ground, of course, they rotted out. Of course, they didn't put foundations in very deep because when people moved here, they didn't really understand the prairie and the soil and frost heave and all that kind of stuff. So, so many great buildings failed because of the foundations. So, a lot of times what we do is get asked to come in and lift these buildings up. And just as in the case of many of them, this one's full of stuff which means I can't get really big I-beams in there. There's cars and buggies and you know, hay and all sorts of things like that. So what we have to do is come in with a bunch of short I-beams kind of all the way around the building. And I lift it up and uh, we put a new sill plate underneath it, a new timber. And in a lot of cases, the foundation isn't really all that good. So I won't often go to the expense of excavating the whole thing out because many of those rubble foundations, you know, they're put together with 300 PSI mortar or something like that, which is not much different than what we use today with limestone, but they've kind of, you know, spread out a little bit. So I often just go right back on top of them, lift the whole building back about eight inches, just throw some new pieces of limestone right in on top of that old foundation and tuck point it back together. Um, You'll notice that in the case of this sill restoration, um, we had to cut all the siding off. And what I don't have is a finished photo, but what we did is we just put some Z flashing in there. We put what's called a water table board around the bottom, just a trim board. Trimmed it all out, flashed it so the water can't get back to the sill anymore. I usually run the flashing up about three feet because one of the reasons that the sills fail, battens fall off, water gets in between the boards goes and sits on top of the sill, sill plate rots out. Um, so this is a pretty common thing for us to do as well. And of course, we, we get into drawings. And um, early buildings were built using these kind of drawings. They're built using a pair of dividers and some geometrical structure like the daisy wheel. So in the case of this particular building, it has an 812 pitch, which is also known as one third pitch, which is a kind of roof pitch that we've been using for a couple thousand years. And the reason that we build buildings with pitches like that is because it falls within the ability to use a pair of dividers, draw a circle, 
create roof pitch. You don't have to know any math. You don't have to know any other stuff. You can do all that on the ground with a couple of sticks and a string. So early barns were built with drawings like that, which morph into something like this if you put them on paper. Cool thing about a drawing a barn with this kind of stuff is that you really only need one diameter. And just another little interesting side note, when people settled in the Midwest and in a lot of places, 16 foot 6 inches is one rod, and one rod is one chain, and many of the early buildings are 16 foot 6 inches tall. So the unit that they used was a rod to create this overall circle diameter. Anyway, it's really interesting to me, but probably really boring to you guys. Um, this is what we draw when we do buildings. So this is another threshing barn up in La Fox, Illinois, and it's at the Garfield Heritage Farm. And we did some restoration budgeting for him. He had a lightning strike on his barn up here, burned up a couple rafters, kind of burned up the gable wall a little bit. So for $38,000, we went in, stripped all the siding off, rebuilt the gable end of the building, reframed it, put, let's see, put new siding back on, and then he had us put the old siding back on over the new siding because it was a living history museum and they wanted to see the old wood. Um, but what we've shown in yellow are things that might need to be replaced. And oftentimes, with things like this, we'll go through and um, actually do two-dimensional drawings like this that show areas that need to be repaired. And when we start working for some of these public agencies, that's kind of the level of detail those boards want to see. They want to know what they're paying for. So um, just a little bit of shop work. Um, this is what buildings look like when they come back to our shop. And then once again, they go into, the build, into our barn or into our beamery to get assembled. This is a floor system. Floor systems are a problem. Uh, this happens to be for a house. This is a Greek revival house that I moved from Michigan to California. But it's very typical of what you might see in the countryside as a hall and parlor. So it's often a building that's 16 or 20 by 36 or 40. They're kind of everywhere. Two-story hall and parlor <coughs> house from the 1840s to 1860s. Often had really nice timber frames inside of them. Um, here's that floor system reinstalled on a new foundation. A little bit more about how we go through that process. And uh, a damaged sill turns into something like that. So wedged, under squinted, stop splayed scarf is what this one's called. There's, um, there are about 400 different scarf joints that people have used over time. We use about a dozen of them in our shop. And of course, pegs, people always ask us where we get our pegs from, whether they were for the tractor club or new buildings or old buildings. There are, are a couple big peg suppliers in the United States, and so we buy everything from extruded dowels to things that people make on a table saw in octagonal shape to draw bore pegs, which would be typical of buildings built here. Yeah, pegs need to be dry. The timber needs to be green. And if you have an octagonal peg, then you're doing a do using a method called draw boring, which means that the hole in the tenon and the hole in the mortise is laid out on the ground and there's a 16th or 8th inch offset between those two holes and that octagonal form that it becomes, the reason it's octagonal is so that it cuts through the side of the wood and draws the joint together, but you have to do that with dry wood because if you used a green peg it would shrink and the joint would open up. In the frame's green and the peg's dry, the frame shrinks around the peg. Yeah, yep. And so what this, this is a shaving horse, so we're making draw bore pegs for a frame that we're working on. Um, that's my son, actually. One of the things that we do, too, is we use a lot of old tools to teach our apprentices how to do this work. And we start with something like this. This is a 1880s Miller Falls mortising machine, pretty high-end machine for its day. But this is what we use, electric mortisers. So we start with the old hand crank job, and we go to this. And interestingly enough, um, it really only takes about three times as long to do a mortise by hand as it does to use this tool, which isn't really very long, considering we can make the same size mortise in about a minute and a half and do an old mortise with a boring machine in about four or five minutes. And one of the things that our company does is we go all over the place, we give demonstrations, we cut little frames, we hew out timbers, and we try to get all of our staff 
understanding how to use old stuff before we give them new tools. Um, <clears throat> this was a $323,000 restoration for a client, which is kind of rare. But this barn was really important to him, and it was on their family farm, and it was in pretty tough shape. And oftentimes, it would be pretty rare for somebody to have me do a full restoration on a building like this, so it's pretty special. It's over in Alito. Um, but really, the bulk of the frame was pretty intact. I mean, you can see at the girt line here where there's a lot of rot. Unfortunately, that's where the siding transitioned because it was a 30-foot tall wall, so a lot of weather got in there. Um, but it's a 42 by 42 foot square clear span frame from about 1860 and um, It's really unique. I've only found five others of these in the country and they're all pretty much in a straight line from New Hampshire to Michigan two in Illinois and one in Iowa and uh, it's a floor plan that, that works pretty well. It had a, um, a hay carrier in it that ran around all four sides and down the middle so it had two switching tracks so it's pretty neat. It's still got a drive bay. There's still a threshing floor in the middle, but all the sheaves are stored to the sides and stacked up, which is a bit, a bit of an unusual design for a clear span frame. And this is why it was so unique. It had a boss pin in it. And this is the truss that's holding this building together. And from our perspective as carpenters, this is more along the lines of what I might see in a church or um, what I'm, you know, we've done work on like the Iowa Capitol building when it burned. You know, that's the level of carpentry that usually you see in those kind of buildings. Not so much in barns, but really exceptional workmanship. Um, I think overall this building was about 72 feet long, but we didn't put this part back on it. We put that part back on the front. And uh, it's like, as I said, it's a 30-foot sidewall, so that's a 30-foot 12 by 12. And here we are putting the new frame back up already. So obviously you can see where we've replaced all the girts. We've kept all the posts. We've put this building on a slab on piers. Uh, we did put, it was a bank barn, so we put a big foundation wall back in the front. We had a couple of posts that were rotten, so we used some scarf joints. Um, and that's a pretty typical scarf joint for horizontal repair work. Hey, Rick. Yeah. When the barns were built in 18 no, this, um, this, this frame would have come from probably from that time period, either like Chippewa or somewhere else along the Wisconsin River. And it would have been floated down the river in raft form and then sawn at Warehouser's Mill in the Quad City. So this building still has a lot of raft holes in it. And the raft holes are places where you drill a hole, drive a little sapling in, and then you tie the whole raft together. I think the largest raft on the Mississippi River was 1,400 feet long and something like 235 feet wide. Wow. So it was something like um, a billion board feet a year for almost 50 years came down the Mississippi River, was sawn in the Quad Cities, and then was distributed out across um, the country. And if you look at the Midwest and you look at a province like British Columbia, we actually have more timber, had more timber in the Midwest than they have in British Columbia or ever had but it only took them 70 years to completely log all that out. So the last raft on the Illinois River, I think, was like 1910 or something like that. They started about 1840, 1850. A billion board feet a year, something like that, they would saw. So that's where this stuff came from. And um, would you size it, or would you just your own timbers, and you'd get a little bit more value added on the sale. So if you had 400 acres of timber and you wanted to convert it manually, then you got a higher price for your material by doing that. So a third of this barn was probably hewn in Wisconsin. The other two thirds was floated down the river and sawn in the Quad Cities. It's a close up joint of that scar and uh, a plate repair from a leaky roof over one of the drive bays. Close up of that scar joint. It's a pretty close cut. Yeah. Yeah. To get the double angle and the pieces. Yep. That's pretty yeah. Do you use a jig to do that? No, it's all freehand. Yeah. Yeah. Can I measure more the old paint? We do a combination of things. Some people have a skim plane, which means we take these big 12 inch wide hand planers, electric hand planers, and just run them over the timber once. Um, sometimes they have us pressure wash them. 
And then we have these things called wheelie brushes, which are, they have a wheel like a vacuum sweeper sort of, and they're kind of in a motor and you just kind of run them along the timber. And they'll take not only dirt off, but they'll kind of go back down to that lighter colored wood. This frame, we did nothing to. All we did was oil it. Uh, the new wood there, but yeah, I mean, the tolerance in our shop is really a sixteenth of an inch. That's where we're working. I mean, it's really hard. I mean, it's harder to get to like a thirty-second, but we're we're always at about a sixteenth um, with any of those kind of cuts because if we have multiple scarf joints, a couple of sixteenths becomes three sixteenths, and the building gets bigger. We don't want that. So it does have to be pretty close, and it takes about five years, three, four to five years for somebody in our shop to get to the point they can cut like that. Doesn't happen overnight for sure. And yeah, we get like the, the bottom of some of those cow barns have an odor that yeah. is, I mean, you get it all nice and clean and, and you want to use it for something other than cows. We use a product called Landark, which has citrus in it. And so, what we often do with barn home conversions is put that product on there, give it a little wash, odor goes away. What's the product name again? Landark. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's the oil that you were mm -hmm. talking about. So you're not just using linseed oil or anything. It's, it's yeah, it's a linseed oil based product that has heart pine resin, citrus, beeswax, um, and something else in it, like tongue oil. But it's primarily a linseed oil turpentine based product. That's um, just a photo of that truss at night looking up at it. I thought that was. It's just so unique for this area that I, I took a lot of photos of it, actually. Um, in the case of some of these buildings, if I can't haul the whole thing, I actually was just going to crane the whole roof off, but we had a problem with some utility poles that I couldn't move in the middle of winter to get 42 feet down the road. So a lot of times I just take off different pieces. So you'll see the entryway roof here, the main truss, and um, we're actually just setting that new roof back on with a telehandler that never came apart. And that's the frame without the old drive bay on the back. And there's a night photo. The inside shot, so <clears throat> as I said early on, we replaced a lot of roof sheeting and uh, wall sheeting. So this is the old frame. About 50% of the hay mouth floor and threshing floor is still intact. All the roof sheeting was replaced. All the wall sheeting was replaced. Most of the rafters stayed original. Um, he had us use uh, the old siding on the front of the building. And in a lot of cases, I just turn it in because I can get paint to apply better to the inside surface than the outside surface. So I just turn it around. We put the original windows back in it, um, but we actually made them in our shop. I think only half of the actual sash were still good. And then painted it, put battens back on it, and he had us add a cupola. Um, which we built the shop and then just craned on top of the building once we were all done. And uh, it's another uh, series of barn restoration photos. This is another sort of unique building. It's fairly narrow, but it was 90 feet long. And it was an 1820s era barn near St. Louis. It's very typical of uh, medieval style barn frames where they're very sprawling and you have a lot of things happening in them. Everything from hogs to cows to cisterns to um, milking, chickens, people living in them, you know, all sorts of stuff just kind of keeps happening as you go along. And that's the kind of barn this was. Um, even little workshops and a little spot to raise a wagon and a winch and, a, and hay storage and grain storage and all sorts of things. And so this building um, went to a uh, living history museum as well. We dismantled it and then we re-erected it as a um, community raising again. and. If we want to avoid a lot of the trauma of putting all sorts of people underneath these big heavy bents when we raise them, we use these things called turfer winches, which um, there's a snatch block here to a hook, and then there's another snatch block down at the bottom, and then there's a winch right here, a little hand crank winch. And those winches were invented in World War II for pulling tanks out of rivers. And they, they're bodied mach machines like this, kind of narrow, and they work under this principle that one hand is sort of catching the other. And they're incredibly safe and they're incredibly powerful, but they're also kind of expensive. And um, that particular winch, we've got a 5,000 pound winch on both sides, which makes it real easy for two guys 
to lift up three or 4,000 pounds dead right off the ground. Um, so we, that's one of the things that we do to get by having to lift up a lot of heavy stuff with volunteers. So every person you see in this photo, for example, is a volunteer. And um, when we do these community buildings, we try to do as much as possible at once. So we put the siding on, the roof on, the rafters, all that stuff at the same time. As it's being built behind, we've got the other beds stacked up in front. Um, Pre-paint the siding on the ground. And then I think the first bent is going up as this backside of this barn is painted here. And then finished again. Big drive bay down the middle. Most of the frame was rotten underneath. Um, the queen posts and the haymow were good. The haymow flooring itself was good. But once again, this was about preserving that frame, that barn typology from that time period that's pretty rare. And uh, of course, corner posts, These are this is a quickie kind of repair that we do a lot. A lot of barn corners are rotten. So for six or 7,000 bucks, we might come in and spend about two days ripping a corner post out of a building, putting a new one in. This is over in Indiana on an 1840s barn. Um, what we've done is mapped all the mortise locations, made the new piece on the ground in the uh, morning, and then in the afternoon I put it in. And we just install that new timber. And then inside, it's all buttoned up. So in the, in the original photo, of course, um, this timber was all rotten in the corner and the barn was starting to sag off. So we redid all these connections, put the braces back in, scarfed in a new bent girt, scarfed in the new tie beam up here. We did that in about two days overall. <clears throat> this is another pretty unique barn. This is a, a hay barn in uh, Plainfield that's 48 by 112 with a 24 foot sidewall. And what we're looking at there is the north face. Um, and of course, they'd never put anything but wood shingles on it, so everything rotted from the inside out as they didn't maintain it. And the whole north wall rotted off. It's kind of a bad photo, but um, basically just cut a third of the barn away. Left everything supported on the inside. Came back and reframed a new 112 foot long wall for them and resheeted the roof uh, up about two thirds of the way on that face. And then sighted it again. I think this was like, I don't know, it's like 272,000 or something. Um, it's a lot of work. It took us a couple months, I think, to do that. It's a big, it's a lot bigger barn than it looks like in those photos. It's absolutely. Yeah, I mean, it, it is. And, and, and um, you know, a lot of it is just what is important to people. And in a lot of cases, what's important to these people are those buildings. And so they always have to weigh that with new costs. So in general, most of this restoration, all of it actually, is still cheaper than what it would cost if they hired me to replicate that building. So that's kind of where we start when we start talking to these people. They're like, I want a timber frame barn. That's what I want to have. So what does it cost me to have you fix it? What does it cost me to have you make another one? And that's exactly the case with this building. This is about a $120,000 restoration. Once again, it's on a bad foundation. This barn is important to these people, though. You can see it's kind of all over the place. So we jacked the whole building up and put a new foundation underneath it. We actually reframe the whole cat slide section of the lean-to. So that's all new framing. And then that's what they're left with. New roof, new paint, new foundation, new lean-to built, new sill plate. And um, because we work on the frames, we deal with a lot of hardware. So we fab all of our own hardware if we need it. We have a forge and we'll make pencil hinges and that kind of stuff. We'll buy it, we salvage a lot of it and restore it. And uh, of course we also have a lot of barns for sale. This is one near Woodhull that we don't actually sell them. I'm more in the business of um, people come to me and they want a building so then I try to go find one for them. 
I don't take buildings down unless they're going to have a home, again, as a building. So we're not in the business of taking them down and, say, like making flooring out of them. So this is one that uh, the owners don't want anymore. I think it was built around 1870 or something, and we're just we're trying to help them find a new home for it. Rick? Yeah. That building there, do you know what the history about the food flow that was up on top of it? I saw pictures of it. Yeah, I haven't seen the barn yet, but uh, so the building is for sale. It's going to be moved out. Yeah, they don't, I mean, they're not even charging for it. I mean, most people don't. I mean, when they don't want a building, it's because they can't afford to fix it, or they just plain don't want it, or they don't want to pay the cost of having it dismantled or dis demolished or something like that. So they just don't want the building. This Which, building they had a coop over the, the fire hand stayed yep. up on top of the coop over. This building is huge. There's a big staircase that went up. I haven't seen it, but this is what I've been told. Yeah, the cupola was 20 by 20. It was a two-story cupola. It's huge. It's huge. It's like 800 square feet of living space on top of this uh, barn. Yeah. <clears throat> Some of you may know um, this farm. This is Jan King's farm over at Walnut Grove. So one of the other things that we do is just simple maintenance for people. And this is a barn that's been pretty well maintained over the last 150 years. And we'll do things like uh, a bunch of wind came in and blew off all the shingles here where the gambrel hip was. So we just came in and fixed all the shingles for her and um, did stuff like that. So along with taking them down, I don't mind going and just doing a little bit of repair work for people as well. And we do other things, and I, I just threw this photo in here. Um, sort of an interesting parallel to that barn in Alito. This is in Independence, Iowa, and um, it's one of the last flour mills left. This was built about 1867. It's a six-story timber frame, but it's built with exactly the same wood that the Alito barn was built with. And uh, due to a whole bunch of reasons, in 1999, the first floor of this building got washed out by a flood. So um, drilled a hole through the foundation. We went and pulled all the meal floor timbers out and rebuilt a whole new big heavy timber floor system underneath it for them <coughs> just last year. But a very kind of impressive building. Where is that barn located? The one in Alito? Um, oh, that mill? It's right downtown. Yeah, it's right down, right next to the bridge. Yeah, you can't miss it. Yeah, it's a great building. It's beautiful. This is an example of cabin work. This is a cabin I did in Oklahoma, but I threw this in here just to show the chinking and the log work. And in general, log cabins they're about they usually take about fifty percent new wood. Um, but this is all built out of oak, actually, the shingles, the siding, timbers. And a little shot of the fort we did in Metropolis, Illinois. <coughs> More log work, replication kind of work. Some barn doors. We like to make doors as well, but these are kind of a high-end oak and walnut hybrid with really big pencil hinges. Any questions on this stuff? How much do you do the work on that log cabin was like um, 176,000 bucks. And that's uh, dismantle it, rebuild it, new floors, new windows, new doors, new hardware, new stairs, new rafters, new shingles. Yeah. How long did it take you to do all that? What's that? How long did it take you to get all that done? That cabin? Uh, I think I did that in four weeks with three people or something like that. Four people. Maybe it was six Pretty weeks. Good wages, huh? Well, it's. <laughs> It's not bad. I had to go all the way to Oklahoma to do it. It's on an Indian reservation, but it might have been six weeks, something like that. you have a lot of people looking for old barns? Um, we have ten times more barns available than we have people that want them right now. But if anybody has one that they don't want, we offer to put it on our website for them and see if somebody's interested in it. The problems with codes and stuff and regulations? As far as barn restorations or new construction? Uh, restorations. Not really, because even like in the west suburbs, in the Chicago area, most of this stuff falls underneath historic work. So like even, even public use buildings, you know, we'll see nothing compared to what we might do with a new residential timber frame. So, no. Yeah. 
most expensive? Uh, like restoration? Or new construction? That fort, I think, was like cost the state like 890000 Something like that. It's 200,000 board feet of oak. Anybody else? Yeah. Family farms out in the It's called the horse farm. The horses were scaffolded. Yeah. When was Franklin started? Clapbirds? 1450, maybe? 1400? Maybe even a little before? I haven't seen any farms that have that. It just wasn't a common practice. Well, we have to remember that in order to, like, early clapbirds, um, were made on a clabbered break, and so it's a, you can only make clabbers about six to eight feet long, up until about say 1750. And by the time early 1700s started rolling around, you started being able to make clabbers a little bit longer on a pitman saw. Um, and then it really wasn't until probably early 1800s that we were able to make them here in the Midwest mechanically. The concept of using clapboards on a building actually began with doors about 1,000. That's the oldest door that is in existence in European culture, and it's made out of clapboards. So the concept of clabbering things began with doors. Ended up that people started like here, a lot of cabins that we might work on have clapboards on the gable ends, but they're really no longer than six feet. We really don't see clapboards on barns really until 1860s, 1870s especially with that boom that was going on then, that big agricultural boom in the 1870s, 1880s, where people were investing exorbitant amounts of money in their barns and really doing a lot of trim details. That even when we do like this restoration on the Alito barn, for example, you know, nice restoration, a lot of work, good job, but he could have gone farther. He didn't even go to the level of the original building. So that clapboarded siding barn really started happening about the mid 1800s, and really stopped probably um, by 1920. Clapboard is like um, you'll have some kind of plank that's beveled, usually from like a sixteenth to five eighths or sixteenth to half. Um, so it's in the shape of kind of a long slice of pie, and you lay that clapboard over the other clapboard. You might have on an eight inch clapboard something like six inches of reveal, something like that. Yeah, similar. Yeah. Yeah, and there was a there were quite a few buildings built around 1900s that had a T and G clabbered, and then there was also a trend for a what some people call a Dutch laps clabbered, which was a ship lap one. Some of the restoration work that we do, we get into some of these clabbered barns, and we just make those runs on our molder. Because um, that, some of that stuff is unavailable now. One thing we know about your great great grandfather, he spent more on wine stuff stock than he did on his paper. Did he? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Are, yeah. Are the farms around here, do they have a style, a name? Well, I know that we were down in Gatlinburg many years ago. Mm -hmm. and the farms there, I don't know how to describe it, are much different shapes. Uh, I think interesting. There is some really interesting stuff about Illinois. Um, especially Iowa, um, Illinois, Iowa, even Wisconsin, um, the Midwest in general. And part of it's because you had a settlement pattern from New England, you had a settlement pattern up the Mississippi River, you have it down through Chicago. And so you've got three different places, that, three different ways this country, this part of the country was settled. So what we find in the Midwest is a greater diversity of barns in general than we find anywhere else in the country because you had people coming right off the boat from the Czech Republic or England or Germany. You had New Englanders coming overland. And so the New Englanders were building the typical American barn, which is known as the Three Bay Threshing Barn. That's the barn that's on every homestead from 1840s to 1880 even. And then as the agricultural boom shifted, the next thing that happened in Illinois really was all the, the science and agriculture that started to blend together. And so we start to see a whole generation of buildings that don't even have anything to do with the past. And all these new different things, 13-sided barns, 20-sided barns, 10-sided barns, 
square barns like the Alito barn, um, barns like the beef barn, these engineered barns, you know? So the answer to your question is a long one, but no. There really isn't because you've got everything. Everything from a Schweitzer barn that might be a Swiss immigrant, that's a log building, to a typical English three-bay threshing barn, to a Dutch barn. It's really, there's a huge amount of diversity out there. Amazing diversity, really. Yeah? Uh, do you have stone masons that travel with you to do uh, stone foundations? Yeah, <coughs> we do, and, and, and in part because the work is so specific, not that it's um, something that somebody can't figure out, but it's so specific to the type of limestone, and it's really important in all the foundation work that we do that we don't use any kind of Portland product. And so over the last decade or so, I have two masons that really travel about a 500-mile radius with me. So a big part of that mill in Independence, actually, was tuck pointing the granite. And those guys traveled with us to do that job tuck point the building. Okay, uh, along with that, are you able to get new stones or replace those? Oh yeah. Most of the quarries that made this stuff are still around today. So if we want to match limestone on a barn in Illinois or Iowa, for example, it's pretty easy to do because most of the quarries are still there. The stone pretty much looks the same. And they make the same size stone now that they did 150 years ago. So it's a little bit you know, more uniform in shape and size, but it's the same product. Anybody else? Yeah? How did you develop your passion for this business, and what kind of formal training many of your crew take to get to this level of confidence? Well, for me, um, a lot of it is the fact that I don't want to live in something that would be considered like a disposable society. I don't like to throw things away. So the passion for me comes in the fact that as a carpenter, I understand how much work it takes for me to build a new building like this. So I look at those buildings and I'm like, you know, for half that time, I could fix it and that building would get another 150 years. And I find myself at a time in history when, you know, we're starting to see a lot of buildings go away. And really what we have to do is educate people about the fact that we're really at that 100 or 150 year time when it's just maintenance. It's not that we have to throw it away, it's just maintenance. For the last 100 years, you've been getting away with not doing much, besides maybe putting a roof on it, but it's time to do something. So that's where the passion comes from me, and that I believe that we need to fix things and not throw them away. As far as training goes, um, as I said, there's a federally approved apprenticeship program for timber frame carpentry. It's not specific to restoration but it goes along with what it is that I do, which is heavy timber construction. So there's a formal training program for that. Other than that, I just have to bring people in my shop, train them, and uh, move on. And we also do, there's a, it used to be a course um, until 100 and so years ago that you would have a three-year apprenticeship program where you had to travel and work. So all of our guys travel around the country and work in different shops. We have a lot of people that come and work in our shop. Like right now, I have two interns from England. I pretty regularly get interns from places like Germany and Switzerland because the concept of a whole wood building is so foreign to them. For example, in England, they stopped building wood houses in 1800. So you're looking at 200 years of stone history. And now there's a huge revitalization of timber buildings in Europe. They're coming to the States now to learn how to do this again because Essentially, we kept doing it for a long time. So that's where some of our staff and education comes from. Some of those programs, like the Compagnons and the Zimmermen in Europe, are still in place. Um, they still travel for three years and a day. That all kind of feeds into how it is that people learn what it is they need to learn for our shop. But it's a 10-year thing. It's really 5,000 hours of work before you can even get out of the apprenticeship stuff. Um, which is a hard thing to convince people who are into uh, immediate gratification with their education. So one of the things that's happened with construction prices is that panels have started to go up in price. So as in the Ada barn here, the Antique Engine Tractor Club, we only put structural panels on the gable walls and the roof because they were going to do windows and stuff down below. And then later on, they were going to maybe put some sheds on it for a kitchen. So it, it wasn't economical to do that. 
So 100% of the time almost on roofs and about 50 or 60% of the time on walls. Because one way to think about structural panels is, um, you know, it's great if you've got a wall that has an R value of 29. But if it's full of windows, it's really just like taking tissue paper and sticking it in chicken wire. It's not really doing you any good. So on roofs, they make a lot of sense because you can get an R39 on the roof. The labor to install them is pretty quick. We can do about 1,000 square feet a day with four guys. Um, they're really a nice piece of new technology, but they need their place in the building industry, really. So I don't use them 100% of the time. Typically, they're used in dwellings. Yeah, dwellings, I mean, commercial buildings for sure. You know, we've actually bid quite a few buildings that are just stretched skin panels, no timber frame work at all. Sometimes it's just a bunch of LVLs. So you can, the reason they're called stressed skin panels is because you don't need the frame so much. Um, so you can actually do a lot of value engineering on the timber frame. And as we've seen the economy drop off really badly in new home construction, we've started to see more hybrid buildings and probably less stuff like this, which I was doing 10 of a year for a, 10 years, where we were doing full frames for people. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. And uh, they're pretty easy to put on. I mean, it takes a couple days to kind of get the hang of it, but after that, they're not too bad, and they do make the building pretty tight. There are some downsides to making a house too tight, in my opinion, but um, you have to really up your mechanicals if you're gonna do that and put recovery ventilators in and things. But I think on this pavilion, on this building, rather, they were a really perfect application. And this was a common rafter building. And so the idea with this particular barn was to replicate a barn structure. So I think, you know, really, I made this sort of blanket statement at one point in time that this is probably the first timber frame barn built in this county out of local material in 150 years. For 150 years, we've been importing material into a place, into this county, and building buildings with it. Part of my mission is to show people that they can actually build things out of stuff that they have at their disposal or in their hedgerows or in some 20-acre lot that they've still got. We're doing a house not far from here, actually, um, all out of timbers this guy's going to pull out of this uh, ravine he's going to flood for his lake. Takes about 10,000 board feet to do a house. This frame had 24,000 board feet in it. Um, it took us about two months to mill it. But it's a big building. Yeah. How many of the barns do you work on are made Well, hue and lumber really stopped about 1855. And just to give you another quick statistic, around 1900, there were 320,000 barns in Illinois alone barns. Right now there's 35,000 in the last census. So we've lost a phenomenal amount of building. Of those that we lost, half of them could have been hewn because they were older. But now it's more like about 10 or 15 percent of what we might work on as a hewn frame. They're getting to be pretty rare, which is why so many living history museums, historical places, historical societies, are really trying to suck up these log buildings and these human frames. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you squared it up, squared it up out of human, you know, hewing it out of square stock. Yeah. These, um, these panels on this frame come pre cut, so when we do houses and other buildings, the openings all come. Pre-cut, you know, you have to do is buck them out, put windows and doors in them. That's all one sheeting, too. It's not, yeah. It's not four by eight sheets. That's right. Yeah. They come off the rail car as eight by twenty fours, so the OSB is made at the factory as an eight by twenty four. So when we do roofs, we try to do eight by twenty four panels, and it's OSB, EPS, white foam, and OSB glued together in a vacuum press, that's it. I tend to not be of the camp that we should just build buildings out of stress skin because I know what happens to OSB after it gets rained on four or five times. So what we often do is see, see structural panels as the mechanism by which we can quickly enclose a timber frame building, but I want the building to have a structure of its own so that if the skin fails, the building doesn't fail. 
So in this case, you see us putting panels over something that is a very stout frame. And oftentimes, I'm asked by my clients, well, why do I even need a timber frame? Well, you don't. You can hire me to build you one inside there if you like, or you can hire me just to put panels around it. That's your choice. But um, my belief is that we should use structural panels as a replaceable item over a building that should have a four or 800 year lifespan. I recently went and did some work on a building in England that was built in 1100 by the Templars. It was in the hands of private people until 1970 and used as a wheat barn until then. Been in agricultural, for, been in agriculture for 800 years. Those are the kind of buildings that I built. And that's the kind of building that we built for the Antique Engine Tractor Association. Barring some natural catastrophe or vandalism, that building should stand there for 800 years. And that's the intent. <laughs> right. That's right. Yeah. And there's some hardware in this one. Um, anytime we go to span distances, we generally involve a little bit of hardware in the scarf joints. Um, just because we were working for these guys at the time, we made the hardware a bit more kind of mechanical looking. So it's a different kind of, uh, it's some hardware that we had not used before. And you, can, you can't see much of it, but the area that I'm talking about is right in here on that photo. Um, and basically what we need to do when we span long distances is have some way to make that long piece of tension member. And so what we do is incorporate some hardware in there to grab that scarf joint together, which is the same kind of scarf joint I showed lots of photos of in other restoration work. Well, we could probably figure that out. If we just looked at the frame at 24,000 board feet, that'd be 100,000 pounds of wood. So um, there's probably 1,000 pounds of steel in it. The thing that this building has, you'll notice that these posts are all on concrete piers which is something that we do a lot for commercial work and public work, especially when we build pavilions. So inside that concrete column um, is a plate flush with the top of the concrete. It has some fastener that goes down inside the concrete. Sometimes we use something like all thread. Sometimes we just use a metal plate that we tie into the rebar cage. And then the posts all have things called slot mortises in the bottom of them. And so there's this T-shaped plate that sits in the bottom of the post that's held in with steel pins. And we erect the bent up on top of this foundation wall. The plate, which we call the embed plate in the concrete pier, is larger than the plate in the bottom of the post. As the bents go up, I tack weld them in. The plate on the post gets tack welded to the plate on the pier. And then we go ahead and we start erecting the frame. We've got positive contact down there at that point. And then, once the whole frame's up, we can square it up we can knock those tacks loose if we want to. And then once it's square and plumb, we go around and weld the whole thing down to those concrete piers. And that's how this building was constructed. It gives us a nice, good, rigid way to anchor the building to the foundation without dumping a lot of money into concrete walls and sill plates. Early buildings were built with lots and lots of sill plates because the foundation was floating. Nowadays, we have concrete. And so people don't want to spend the money on sill plates. So we just take and anchor our posts, whether we're doing a house or a barn like this, right to the concrete. And in the case of the Ada barn here, uh, we kept the concrete to a minimum because cost was such a huge factor with this project. Volunteer labor, donated money, things like that. You have to love that engineering because you got up this wind up this low, that sort of thing. Yeah, I mean, we have to figure a fair bit of wind. Um, I mean, we can't figure for 400 miles an hour, but most of this stuff is figured for like 90. We're trying to counter that straight line wind that pushes a building off of its foundation. The flip side to that, and one of the reasons that timber frame barns historically withstand tornadoes better is because in general, the roofs aren't attached very well. So when they get hit by the wind, the wind goes inside of them, just blows the roof off. If you do too good a job anchoring things together, you just twist everything up and break it. So if I'm gonna anchor a building like this down, I actually have to make it stouter than a building of historic precedent would have been. I got to do a little bit better job of making my joinery work than I would have had to do 150 years ago as a carpenter on a building that's just floating on top of a pile of rubble. 
they can kind of get pushed around by the wind in the ground and take a little bit of abuse. This building won't take any abuse. It'll just shear the posts off or shear the foundation off. So you'll notice that these posts are like eight by tens. Um, what? What did I say? Yeah. Won't take any like, you know, you hit it with a 200 mile an hour wind or 150 mile an hour wind, it's not gonna, it, it's, not, it's got no give point. Because, oh, oh all right. <laughs> so I mean, we, that's, that's the only thing we have to take in mind when we start getting, when we start mixing technology with the past a little bit. Where? Here, on the, with the crane? Crane, strap. Oh, these. What holds the panels to the roof? All right. These things. Um, these are these are what we call panel plates, and we've engineered those to withstand a 5,000 pound force. Which means that what I do is screw those panel plates to the OSB with about a dozen screws, and they're clipped in with a shackle. And so when the panel drops on the roof, you just take the shackle off, or you've choked it around the panel plate and you've hooked it on the hook, and you just let those go. Then once the guys are up there, um, they can clip into those panel plates too, which keeps us OSHA, keeps OSHA happy because 5,000 pounds is what we need for a direct fall with somebody on fall arrest gear. So we use those panel plates for fall arrest, and we use them for hanging the panels. And the other thing that I figure with panels is I want one of those plates, really, to be able to withstand four times the weight of that panel. Because sometimes you get some strong wind, panel might get hooked on the building. You know, they can be a little bit kind of scary to install sometimes. So the panel plates are actually about this big. And what we've done is we've gone to Farm King and bought some of those things that we weld to the bumper where those trailer hookup deals, D-rings. We weld those to a piece of 3 8 steel, and then we screw those to the panel. Do you leave them on there? Take them off. It takes about a dozen of those plates to do a panel job like this, because you want to have a panel in the air, you want to have a panel being taken off, and you want to have two panels being rigged up on the ground. Yeah. When you're putting those panels up, you're making the butt joints all in the same rafter, rather than Staggering them, right? Yeah, he's using the those things right now to winch it together. Yeah, you can see these things here. We call them timber pullers. They're made in Switzerland. Um, we, that's how we suck it together. But the idea is that the panel breaks on a rafter or a rafter plate or a purlin. Yeah. And then what we do is we attach them to the roof every foot with structural screws, which are essentially engineered lag replacements. So they're a quarter inch or five sixteenth shaft with a big head on it, and then they get a structural washer. It's not really a structural washer, it's really thin. Um, and those go into the panel, into the frame. <clears throat> One of the reasons they work so well on timber frames and really add to the engineering is because they're so big, like that's a 24 foot long panel. They create a shear wall on that roof and they add a lot of rigidity to the building. What so it can withstand a lot of abuse. <laughs> <laughs> but as far as the the butt joints are all on the same rafter rather than being... Oh, you mean like staggering the roof? It doesn't matter. You don't stagger that. You don't have to. I mean, you can, but there's so many screws in it. It's not like you might think when we go to put plywood on a trust roof. You don't have to stagger them. They're just so darn big, and they just grab so much of the building. If we're doing a smaller roof, we might, I mean... This is really where panels shine is on these long runs like this because you can just, I mean, you can, you're basically sheeting and insulating the entire roof in a day. Now, one of the things that we do with a lot of our clients is we pre-apply T and G, tongue and groove wood to the bottom side and it's usually pre-finished so that when this panel goes on, they have the ceiling, the skin, the insulation and the roof sheeting to go ahead and then they can dry it in. So. You can do a roof like this in like three days, insulated and sheeted. There's a cost, of course, for the T and G, but um, that's one of the other reasons that we like to break them. You don't actually have to break them over a timber. If you don't, they, um, we use wood splines between them. But the nice thing about getting in the habit 
of breaking them over timber is that all of your seams then for your TNG are covered. Because what we want is about a quarter inch gap between all the panels all the way around. And then what we do is pump that full of expandable foam. So the whole roof is tight, completely tight. There's no way for air to get in or out. What's the current cost per square foot of that? You know, I want to say six or seven dollars a square foot for that. And usually like with install and crane, it's like 10 or $11 a square foot, something like that. Um, it's, it's kind of hard to figure sometimes because there's so many hips and valleys in some houses, but $7 a square foot for a panel like this and maybe like four or $5 a square foot. Right now the panel industry is super competitive because there's no work out there. So, but they're pretty slick be a good roof for this building. I think actually we've gone through and we've put every other screw in, so there's actually going to be. We usually go back and screw off the whole roof after it's set. A good crane operator makes a big difference too. Yeah, he does. No. Anybody else have a question about this building or old buildings? Is there anything else you guys would like me to say about the